mean, we are mainly working on uh, trying to, to raise awareness out about false solutions to climate change, as we call them. And we consider uh, biofuels as a very big false solution. we are a major concern, of course, massive impacts on deforestation. It's, those are known, I think, to the wider public. But there's still a lot of, you know, subsidies and finance going to, to biomass including wood-based biomass and non-food uh, biofuels. And I think there's not enough awareness that those can be equally damaging because they also replace people and they also trigger uh, forest conversion and the conversion of other ecosystems. However, we're also very critical about red. We think that there's been a lot of fairy tales told about red, about reducing emissions from deforestation, forest degradation, as a potential way to address climate change. We think particularly if you would include it in forest carbon offset schemes, uh, this will basically not lead to any emission reductions, rather to the contrary, because forests are a very unreliable source of carbon, uh, because there's a lot of pro problems at the moment also with, for example, the reference levels, I mean, the way you measure what is actually being done, the way you avoid that if you conserve one forest, it's not going to another place where the, the loggers and, and the soy uh, ranchers. That is why we think that it's, it's really a false solution to climate change. And we think there's a lot of fairy tales that have been told, for example, out $30 billion that will be contributed to that. Um, and what countries are realizing now here at this meeting is that that it's just not true. I mean, there's a lot of stories being told, but that money will not come forward, certainly not via an offset market, but also not via public funding. And what I do hope is that countries come from this meeting with an understanding that we need a, a far more holistic approach to forests. I mean, forests are not just important for mitigation, also very much for adaptation. They're the livelihood of people. They're a source of food for people. Uh, you know, people depend on them. They're important for water levels. So please, let's treat them in a holistic manner. And there are proposals on the table now. For example, Bolivia has proposed to, uh, uh, has put a proposal on the table now that treats forest in a much more holistic manner. You'll be leaving this conference and going back to Paraguay, to Asuncion, where, where you're based. What are the problems? I mean, Paraguay is a, is a country that suffered quite severely from deforestation. What are the specific problems you, you face in Paraguay, a country that perhaps doesn't uh, uh, get that much attention? I mean, we are suffering both from climate change and increasingly from false solutions to climate change. So on the one hand, uh, you know, we have years where we have had massive droughts. Actually, while I was here, uh, you know, I was alerted by my husband that the cars were driving through the streets because last week they had a massive rainstorm uh, with, with one meter of water in the streets. Uh, so it's getting very severe at this moment. It's, it's, it's steaming hot. Uh, there's a lot of ex extreme events. And of course, especially peasants, indigenous peoples, women, they suffer most because you know, they're most dependent on nature. And if suddenly the climate changes and it's not expected, they will be on the front line of receiving the impacts. However, if you look at the false solution to climate change, especially, for example, soy production for biodiesel, uh, it's having massive impacts as well. And we're suffering from both sides. You know, and there's now proposals to have large-scale monoculture tree plantations being funded through a red scheme. And we will suffer massively from that as well, because it will replace farmers uh, from the lands, uh, they, they, they sometimes violently. There's a lot of very violent land struggles in Paraguay. Also indigenous peoples, just last year, a week we had an indigenous communities that saw their school being burned down, the whole community was displaced, and this is all to grab more and more land for the production of, for example, soy monocultures, but potentially if the red, red will work out as some people want it in Paraguay, also for the uh, uh, establishment of large-scale monoculture tree plantation with red funding. Right. So, so red is actually feeding the expansion to some degree of these monocultures, of these big landowners, encouraging them to, to go about the work they're doing, especially in regards to soya. Yes, and one of the big problems you always have with forest schemes, people often forget that forests are the place in the world where the most marginalized people live, the most politically and economically marginalized. A lot of people that do not have confirmed land tenure rights you know, indigenous peoples, uh, landless farmers, they often move to the forest zones because the fertile areas that are already deforested are being taken over big landowners. So there's particularly an issue about land conflicts in forests. If you then develop a scheme that suddenly gives forests and forest lands a tremendous monetary value, 
that will massively increase those conflicts because there will always be a lot of evil people that will then try to grab those forest lands away from those marginal people. And because they don't have confirmed land tenure rights, they can easily do that. And sure, there are nice examples of, of good rock projects. And I'm actually impressed by some of the goodwill of governments that are not so much in favor of red, but are using the red momentum, the political attention for red, to develop quite interesting you know, schemes to halt deforestation. I think those efforts should definitely continue. However, as it was originally designed, giving a big value to forest land and then just hoping that that will lead to forest conservation will be very detrimental for you know, politically and especially economically marginalized people. Right. Uh, you, of course, had the problem in Paraguay that you, you had a government for a while that was sympathetic to the deforestation situation, the situation of, of uh, depo of, um, the word, of peasants being, being thrown off their land by these uh, monocultures. That government was deposed probably by uh, forces uh, um, sympathetic to the big landowners. What do you do in an international context about that kind of situation, where the situation is made worse, perhaps, by the government, uh, the government that's been imposed on the country? Yeah, aside, aside from calling once again upon countries not to recognize this, this government, which clearly came into power through very uh, illegal procedures, what is very important to realize is that we do have indeed a government that's very sympathetic to the large landowners at the moment, and they will abuse schemes like RED to make money for themselves. And we've already seen how they are using several other policies now to actually enrich themselves. And you know, this, that's another RED fairy tale, you know, that oh, we need good governance. But in reality, most countries struggle so much with governance. And of course, this case in Paraguay is one of the worst. I mean, we have total lawlessness now. They have liberalized uh, genetically modified organisms without following any decent procedure. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really problematic to implement a scheme like that in countries where you already are suffering from such basic governance problems. And it will severely add to the problems. Okay, great. Thank you very much.